ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Hello, everyone. Hello, and thank you for coming. My name is Karen Tucker. Welcome to the Churchill Club. Tonight's event is called Innovating Our Way Back, How Will Technology and Innovation Create the Next Big Thing for American Businesses and Workers? And we have a great panel. With us are Amit Chatterjee of Hurrah, Stratton Sklavos of Radar Partners, Gary Shapiro of the Consumer Electronics Association, and uh, Vivek Wadwa of Duke, Harvard, and UC Berkeley. Um, thank you all for being here. And of course, Martin Giles, our moderator. We Sadly, Judy Estrin was unable to participate in the panel tonight due to illness, and we wish her a speedy recovery. I especially want to acknowledge the Consumer Electronics Association for their partnership and for sponsoring this gathering. Thank you, CEA, for making this event possible. And I'd also like to give a special thank you to 463 Communications, um, in particular, Katie Hallen, Tom Galvin, and Jim Hawk. Uh, a few brief announcements. Our next program on March 17, The Art of Changing Hearts, Minds, and Actions, An Evening with Guy Kawasaki is sold out. But on Monday, March 21, we present Innovation to Action, which is a look at trends and strategies for making innovation work inside of the enterprise. For those of you who are less familiar with the Churchill Club, we are a nonprofit, member-supported business and technology forum. We're now celebrating our 25th year. We offer about 40 great programs every year, and we hope that you'll consider continuing to participate and joining us. You can visit us always at churchillclub.org. And then finally, you'll find Twitter codes in your, program, in your printed program. If you're tweeting tonight, please use hashtag Churchill Club. Let me now turn to our moderator, Martin Giles, who is the US technology correspondent for The Economist. You can read all about Martin in his official bio in your printed program. So I thought you might appreciate some alternate information about him in our introduction tonight. The first thing is that Martin created a magazine for the Economist Group, specifically for chief financial officers, and very rapidly it gained more than 70,000 subscribers in large companies across the European Union. And because of this, it won a royal award for export achievement, which was presented by none other than Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Brighton. And the other thing we thought you'd find of interest yeah, about yeah. Martin is that he was once a member of the Oxford University ballroom dance team. <laughs> Rumor has it that he still dances a mean foxtrot, jive, and cha-cha-cha. And his dream job, other than, of course, the one that he holds today, would be then to be a judge on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, judge, not contestant. <coughs> Please welcome respected journalist Martin Giles. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that very generous <laughs> introduction. Um, and, uh, and for inviting The Economist to, to chair a panel tonight. Uh, I apologize for bringing the, the British weather with me. Hopefully it will have disappeared by the time we're finished tonight. Um, it's a fascinating panel, and I, I wanted to start by telling you just a very little story. When I first got to San Francisco as correspondent, we, we bought a house, my wife and I, uh, in the center of San Francisco, and our neighbors said, oh, oh, you're from England. Ah, well, um, we have somebody staying with us next door. You're bound to know them. So <laughs> would you mind if we bring them around? And I said, oh, sure, okay. England's a quite big place. And a gentleman turns up, and lo and behold, it happens to be somebody who is in exactly the same college as me at university a year ahead of me. And he said, you know, oh, Martin, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm a journalist, and what are you doing here? He said, well, I'm starting a company. And I said, that's fabulous. What company are you starting? He said, well, it's an internet company. It's going to do mapping apps for, for iPhones and various other things. I said, that's fab. I said, so where's your office? Is it downtown? He said, no, it's in Beijing. 
I said, Beijing? Why, why, why Beijing? It's Beijing is the place to start companies these days. Nobody wants to start companies in America anymore. You'd be nuts. So he was coming, I said, why are you here? He said, well, I need the money and I need some ideas. Then I'm gonna go all the way back to Beijing because the, you know, the engineers there are fabulous. So it's like, wow, that struck me. That was practically my first experience in San Francisco. I come all this way because I thought Silicon Valley was the center of the universe and all of a sudden somebody next door is telling me, no, 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 the action's all in, in China. And um, I only have one piece of product placement, Karen, this evening, I promise you, but our cover of The Economist, um, last week's edition, it's called Bamboo Capitalism, and it talks all about how Chinese startups, Chinese entrepreneurs, are breaking away from the constraints of the state there and you know, really developing very fast-growing, very interesting new companies. And, of course, it's that kind of activity is happening not just in China, but in India, in Korea, all of those kind of places. And yet, to me, America, it's still the top model on the innovation catwalk that catches everybody's eye. Now, when Russia's Alexander Medvedev's looking for somewhere for inspiration to set up a, a, a new innovative place, where does he come? He comes to Silicon Valley. You know, in London, we have a thing called the uh, Silicon Roundabout or Traffic Circle, which is basically, we, I guess, so that ideas circulate faster. But um, I'm not really sure why we call it that. But everybody wants something silicon because America is still, for many parts of the world, the model. And you know, as an I, you know, if you look at the, the stats, share of global R&D, America still has 40% of global R&D. You know, its spending on R&D is bigger than the seven next largest countries combined. Phenomenal, outpacing everybody. 70% of the world's Nobel Prize winners work for American companies. And many of the world's top universities are here. So, you know, I said to myself, what's, what, what's going on here? You know, and it's, it's an ideas engine that's also a fantastic job engine or has been a fantastic job engine for America. You know, many of the companies that have created jobs have come from startups, you know, Intel, Microsoft, um, Genentech. All of these companies were startups that, that's, that began here and have gone on to create huge successes, platforms, hardware, drugs that have created many jobs, not just for themselves, but also for many of the companies that work with them. So it's deeply worrying that there seems to be at least some evidence now that America's ideas engine may be slowing down. You know, and our panel is going to explore what's gone wrong and what can be done about it. You know, what should be done by government? What should be done by business? And what should be done by us as citizens? Now, it's an immensely complex topic, and we're not going to be able to explore all of the facets of it this evening. Um, so our aim is to examine some of the most important ones, to surface ideas, provocative ideas, I hope, that challenge um, perhaps some of the existing thinking, and then you know, I'll take questions from you. And I do encourage you to, to ask questions from the floor, because we'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are, what issues you think are important here. Make sure that we address them. Uh, and I'll break a couple of times during our discussion to take questions from the floor. Uh, briefly, I'll introduce the panelists. Um, to my immediately left is uh, Amit Chatterjee, who is the CEO and founder of Haram, which is a fast-growing provider of environmental and energy management solutions. You should also know that Amit is an inveterate gambler who won his child's school blackjack tournament, $14,000, he tells me, all of which he's giving to charity, but a remarkable achievement. Next to, next to uh, Amit is Stratton Sklavos, who is the partner in Radar Partners, a professional investment firm, and he's the former CEO of VeriSign. Um, now, believe it or not, Stratton, although he's been 30 years in high tech and has made many investments, he's most proud of his Greek restaurant called Dio Deca, which is in Los Gatos, and has just won a first Michelin star. And he's promised me that you're all going to get a massive discount if you go. <laughs> Uh, next to him is Gary Shapiro, who is the president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association, which represents over 2,000 consumer electronics companies and runs the Consumer Electronics Show, which if you've never been to, is one hell of an experience. It's a fabulous show. Um, Gary is also a black belt in karate, so none of us are going to argue with him this evening. And he actually selected all of the movies that played on Air Force One during the second Bush administration. Don't ask me how, but, and I don't want to know what they are. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, Vivek Wadra, who is uh, uh, very kindly replacing Judy Estrin at short notice, thank you Vivek, uh, is research, senior research associate at Harvard Law School's Labor and Work Life Program, 
an adjunct professor at Duke University and a visiting scholar at the School of Information at UC Berkeley. In his youth, Vivek was also a computer hacker who almost got kicked out of university. Congratulations, that's like a right of entry, right, for most startups these days, so you're doing, you're doing pretty well. Okay, so we have a fabulous panel, and I, I think you know, the, the, the question here is innovating our way back. How will technology and innovation create the next big thing for American businesses and workers? Let's, let's define the subject, first of all. You know, what, what do we mean when we talk about innovation? Mr. Stratton, do you want to have a go at that? What, what, do you, what do we think about innovation? What, what's that term mean for you? Well, I think, you know, we live this and breathe this every day here, and I, I was telling Martin and, and Judy in our call, I think we're coming into this new wave again where innovation is back, right, at least on our doorstep. And it's both new ideas uh, that break convention coupled with new technology um, uh, evolution or revolution that allows those new ideas to reach scale much, much faster. Uh, in our firm, we are, we are constantly amazed at how an entrepreneur will walk in these days and having on his own money or family money or a very uh, low amount of angel money to a tune of $100,000 or $200,000, have something up and running, already be interfacing with tens of thousands of consumers, already getting a feel for what's going to work and what won't, thinking about business monetization. And we're talking about three months instead of you know, 18 months or, or two years to, to revenue traction. Uh, and they're hosting it on EC2 at Amazon, and they've got development tools that let them build the software much more quickly. It's just, it's fascinating to me how innovation, which is new ideas coupled with new technology, has a, a capital efficiency now that I have never seen in our 30 years here, which is, makes it very exciting. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to create tens of thousands of new jobs or allow for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of jobs to be retrained into this new world because the efficiencies that are inherent in it probably set up companies of lesser magnitude than those that might need replacing. Mm. So it's the ideas and it's the, the technology that expresses those ideas. That's right. Uh, Amit, you were talking, talking to me a little bit about business processes. Well, yeah, how, how does that play into innovation? Well, you know, I think uh, to, to build on Stratton's point, if you go historically a little bit backward, um, America really started innovation in post, you know, the early 1900s, where you know uh, Henry Ford came out and talked about the Model T. And what was the real innovation there? Number one, it was the car, but he famously also said, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. The true great differentiation that the United States has over any other country right now is the ability to not only innovate, but to get that innovation in everyone's hands as fast as possible. The internet was the second major trend of that, but I think the next effort or the challenge that we see now is to, to Stratton's point is that while there are smaller companies that are being created on the internet, a lot of huge opportunities in the United States have to come from really achieving scale, whether it's biotechnology, whether it's clean energy, or whether it's some of the new advancements in, in retail and, and consumer packaged goods. There is just a lot of question about how do we build scale back in the United States. Very famously on 30 Rock, um, there was a situation where someone was talking about, not to, not to get too off topic, but I thought it was funny, was Alec, uh, Alec uh, Baldwin. Baldwin, thank you. Alec Baldwin's character talks about, you know, they're in a meth lab uh, in Canada. And his wife exclaims, my gosh, what has happened to man American manufacturing, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a classic example of where we try to outsource everything to every part of the world. And now we're at a point where to create the millions of jobs and the, to put people into the jobs that we need, we have to find a way to create a fertile ground for scaling in the United States. I'd like to come back to that because I think this export of manufacturing issue is, is one that we will come back to. It's a, good, it's a very good issue. Gary, innovation for you. Um, what it's doing something different that people will pay for. I'd go a little bit broader. I mean, uh, Starbucks, Netflix, um, they're innovators. And what's their great technology it really doesn't exist. So it's, and it's creative. I, I think uh, Hollywood motion, the, the movie studios, are every, st every movie that succeeds is, is innovative. So when I talk about innovation, I talk about uh, creativity and doing something different. And obviously, uh, everyone can do that, but can you have someone pay for it is the trick. So it's, it's, it's idea, it's process, it's technology, so long as it's differentiating. Or, or differentiating. you said it's, it could be doing it more efficiently so you have a lower price. I mean, that's, and that's what we're good at here. We're good at it because it's who we are. We, you know, we almost all descended from people who came here for a better life 
and the American exceptionalism, which I believe in, is you're thinking that you can do it better. Or as President Obama said in the State of the Union, our kids are not trained to learn by rote, they're, they're trained to ask questions. It's also inherent in our First Amendment. We're the only country that has that in the sense that you have the ability to, to challenge the status quo and not have your government stomp on you, which mm. is, you know, we don't have groupthink. We're, we're a heterogeneous society, we're diverse, which is great. When I go to the Asian countries, I often think, wow, it's groupthink here. You're not allowed to be different. It's consensus thinking. So we have a lot of the basic agreement, uh, ingredients in the United States which make us exceptional. We also have the best universities. We have a lot of other things which really do make us great. And that is our special sauce, is innovation. Okay. Vivek, your, your take on this? Let me build on what you said earlier on, all this silicon rabbit, silicon roundabout, silicon gyres, silicon everything under the you know, sun. sun. Now, every single experiment in the world on innovation in which they've tried to replicate Silicon Valley has failed, 100% of them. Not billions of dollars, but tens of billions of dollars, possibly hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent by regions trying to replicate Silicon Valley. They followed Michael Porter's flawed theories. I mean, his, his stuff just doesn't work. It's, it's, a, it's yeah, a scam. Absolutely okay. right. The reason is because they're trying to go by the classical route, which you take a university, you throw some venture capital into the area, you build some fancy tech parks, and bang, the magic happens. It never happens that way. The magic is the people. The magic is uh, taking smart people um, you know, who are, af are not afraid of taking risks, who basically are open-minded, um, who, who will basically exchange information with each other, building a network around them, and giving them the tools they need right. to succeed. That's what I've been researching right. Silicon Valley systematically, and right. I can talk more about that later on. Right. Why does it work? Got it. And this is, that's what my conclusion is. So basically, we're exceptional. No one else can do it. They're all rubbish because every time they try no, and set no, that's something not, up. No, I think I, no, 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 I'm, just, I'm just playing J it back. Japan is a great back. example. They're, they're like, rubbish. They, right. they, they try to set up you know, yeah. the, the Chinese, the Indians. They no, don't I, have no they, follow the, the wrong, they follow the wrong recipe. That's the problem. <laughs> Oh, they, they followed the wrong they followed recipe. Michael Porter's recipe, and yet and doomed for disaster. And yet we see Asian R and D thirty two percent now oh. catching up with America. We see exceptional engineers coming out. My mm. friend who sits next to me in this house says, "I don't want to be in America anymore." You know, Bruce Springsteen, born in the USA, keep that uh, pal. I don't want to be born in the USA anymore. Um, go what's back gone to, wrong? Go back Is, to China. Should go we be having this panel? No, wait, go back to China. You talked about all the R and D happening there. It's a small, tiny slice of China, the young yeah. people who are innovating. The state is not innovating. The, the tens of billions of dollars they're investing in innovation, it's all copycat. China is a giant copying machine. Right. They're pirating, they're stealing on a scale <laughs> unprecedented in mankind. See, here's me. The innovation is coming from the, <laughs> but, the young kids. But a more, on, yeah. a more yeah. positive example. I know you're a black belt, A more positive yeah. example is Japan. It's obviously, you know, horribly in the news. But all they have is their people. They don't have any raw materials. They don't have anything else, but they're very bright, hardworking, and honestly, to a large degree, creative people. They built up a lot of great companies there. I, I wouldn't use China as an example. I mean, China doesn't have one brand that's well known in the top 100 brands, according to Brand Week, but they do have efficiency in manufacturing. And I, I, I do want to disagree with you. I'm very much involved in the Northern Virginia technology community. I think we've done okay. We have 2,000 companies there. There are tech companies. And, we're kind of proud it's of that. It's not Silicon Valley. It's not friend. Silicon Valley, but <laughs> <laughs> it's also the Boston. Co I know I'm in the wrong well, environment. I, I, I All right, Silicon Valley well, is the guy. You're taking a lot of heat from on us, are you? Come I took a lot of heat from Boston recently for, for going to MIT and saying that they were <laughs> way behind Silicon. The one thing Valley. I love about America is it's just not parochial <laughs> at all. It's like you know, fabulous well, national it pride Martin, and national. Martin, what does it matter? No, what it. Come on, yeah, I what agree does with it you matter? What does it matter? If there are pockets in, in China, there are pockets in Indonesia, there are pockets in Estonia, there are pockets in you know, Western Europe as well, where right. innovation occurs. That's, it's not either or, right? It, the, our, our whole opportunity and our whole promise is to just keep being better at it than anybody else. Right. Not that they're going to fail, so we must win. Right. We just need to keep winning right, at what we do best. Right. And so, so when I see books like, you know, Come Back, America Needs to, you know. Um, Get the title right if you're going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading here, it says, does America need to make a comeback, Gary's book, plug it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, it says, I isn't the nation that gave the world Facebook the iPad, the first electric sports car, and goodness knows how many other amazing new products, you know, still way ahead of the Google Play. Now I have to turn around and argue it's in trouble. Scaremongering. Is scaremongering just to sell books and newspapers, which of course we love very much? But, <laughs> but it, what, what is, there, there, America seriously has some issues. No, there are some serious issues, right? 
K-12 education, we'll come on to that later on, but, but there are some issues here which one can say America, you know, the, the most common critique that I hear from as, go, as a journalist going around Silicon Valley is that Silicon Valley doesn't do real research anymore. It does the internet. You know, it has the you know, URL model, ubiquity first, revenue later, it's all advertising, we're really good at that kind of stuff. That but was so you know, the stuff, the, the fundamental science, you know, there's people like um, Amit here who are trying to win in areas that are really important for this country's future, but this country doesn't get it. Do you agree with that? Um, I think we've had, we have an interesting challenge. Um, to give you guys a perspective, because I don't know how many of you are in the clean tech sector, but the energy sector is about $7 trillion. To give you an example, you take the top two companies, ExxonMobil and Chevron, that's the equivalent of the entire automotive industry around the world, minus GM, right? So the breadth and depth of the problem that we're trying to address when we look at a $7 trillion market is energy is now in its early nascent stages, right? We look at the top 10 in solar, wind, and battery. You take those top 30 companies, that there's only five that are leaders in the United States. That's the equivalent of letting China own Cisco, Microsoft own Europe, be owned, built out in Europe. It'd be better. It, <laughs> That's okay. And Amazon being created by the Brazilians, right? So when we talk about the future brands, to your point, Gary, there is a huge threat in the United States that we have nothing right now that we've invested in fundamentally to really say that we're gonna take the leadership of the next GDP global wave and take our unfair share, to your point, Stratton, the biggest opportunity and the biggest market share. And all I think America's ever done exceptionally well is take our unfair market share of every single market that's ever been out there. And there's no reason they shouldn't be able to do it in this space. And R&D in particular in this space is, is dwindling, not increasing. But we didn't, it, it didn't start here, right? I mean, it, no. in, in, so I, and I don't know the history of it, but I mean, there was m a lot more alternative energy and clean tech development going on. Already in the, the other US, world. Right. Yeah. And, and I think we are in a catch up mode there. And Vinod and others have you know, been spending a, a ton to try to get us there. With, with you know, I, I'm not sure what the, the, the banner of victory is to wave yet, right, in this. So, so you need to make us one here, but uh, it, that's, we didn't start from ahead. Whereas in, in, certainly in electronics and in tech and in silicon, we started from ahead. Yeah, right? fair enough. But we also had opportunity to build out in, in many of these areas and have not for many years because we started in solar, dis disabandoned it, picked it back up. Well, and I, and I think if we're going to go into this later about government, but I think if you, you turn this around and say, what have other countries done to catch up with us in certain areas? Most of those countries, whether it be Japan, whether it be China, or whether it be uh, Western Eastern Europe, got a lot better policy from their government, right? Whether it was oh. mandated or whether yeah, it was yeah. not, to fund a catch up train. Yes, right. absolutely. And that's probably in, in and, and this now we'll, space. Yeah, and now we we'll get into do. that later, yeah. but you know, that's also where I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think in clean tech where you are is you've got an incumbent economy that's very successful, yep. and how you try to, to move that is not through government subsidy, but by removing government regulation to allow companies to compete effectively. Anybody else thoughts on, on that issue? Or, or where else do we see opportunity for America to take a lead? in new emerging technologies? Where, where should it be focusing? Well, I just get very nervous when I hear this type of discussion because it's like the government is gonna choose this next special industry. And I, I was at the United Nations at a conference representing the tech industry and, and I was beaten up by representatives of other countries talking about what the, UN, what the United States methanol policy has done to starvation around the world. And I think everyone agrees it's the dumbest policy and it's, it's all because of Iowa primaries. Even the Republicans agreed on that. Gore now agrees on it. It's just a horrible policy to subsidize something like that. And I remember sawgrass and biograss and biofuels, and, and there's always some silver bullet answer that we think our government is going to finance, and I don't think that's the way the real world operates. Well, we I don't have to invent dumb policy, Gary. But, but, but there's 30 years of dumb policy. We all know we have an energy problem, and you know I prefer to, to, to do it the way, frankly, Europe and others do it, is to just add to the tax on gasoline, and you get revenue, you, you push people to more efficient cars, you do all sorts of other things that way, seems to make a lot of sense, and there's no silver bullet policy, but when the government starts choosing the next special industry, then, then when does it end? That special industry will be a special industry for the next 50 years, as are all these other special industries out there, and frankly, we can't afford it. I agree, government intervention rarely works. There are a few, a couple of examples, parts of the worldwide, 
but um, by and large, governments never get it right. Bureaucrats don't know what's going to succeed, what's going to fail. Venture capitalists don't know. They get nine out, nine out of, nine out of ten, 10 of their bets wrong. How are some dumb bureaucrats going to figure this out? Right. We need their capital, not their ideas. Yeah, but we are, we are right now under the stimulus package. We have 25, 26 year old kids in Washington with no business experience at all, doling out billions of dollars based on political influence or they, you know, things like, no rational. I mean, if you're going to dole out money, I'd rather give it to venture capitalists and have the government share in the re risk and the reward and, and let the venture capitalists make the decision. And that the 26 year olds doling out billions here. Oh, they're right, right, whatever. But, but <laughs> I think what you don't know, you like better. <laughs> have you met the people in Washington oh, who are here to help? Many, many times. Yes. Let, let, me, let me just push <laughs> back on this just a little because, you know, Amit says, you know, in, in, energy, it's scale. We're talking big, big scale. We're talking major investments. And you have a look at countries like, come back to China. China, which says, actually, by 2020, we're going to have 17% of our energy developed by, uh, coming from either biomass, uh, wind, solar. Oh, and by the way, we're damn well going to invest in this, because this is critical not just to our environment, our energy security, but also because this is going to create tons of jobs in leading edge industries. The government is behind it, but it's a bottom up, it's a, bot a top down and a bottom up effort. So it's not the government solely saying this. There are thousands of entrepreneurs, as our article says, out there looking for opportunities in the clean tech space. Isn't that something that America should be concerned about? Isn't that something that e even though we are very careful about keeping, stepping back from stuff, this is one area where America cannot afford to relinquish the lead? Is it the lead or is it the fact that we're relying on foreign oil and going to wars? I mean, what is the real long-term goal or strategy or purpose? If we can agree upon the facts and agree upon the goal, then you figure out a way to do it. But right now we're saying, let's just go clean tech because everyone else in the world is, and it's a great name. It's like the power grid or something else. It's, it's, it's like, it's the theme of, the de of, of these years and, and five years from now, there'll be, there'll be something else which is really cool and hot that will say government put billions of dollars in. And China isn't innovating in clean tech, they're copying in clean tech, okay? The smartest <laughs> policy that America could have this is to a boost theme, innovation is. is to add two dollars a gallon to the uh, uh, tax on gasoline and immediately you'd spur innovation like nothing else. Right. And you fix a deficit. The simplest poss policy possible, but it won't happen. So that's, it's just that simple. Right. Amit? It's, sorry, where, where do you say that the innovation is going to happen? The innovation is still by happening in America. By putting a gasoline tax together? By, by making gasoline more costly, by making uh, it uh, worthwhile for innovators to create alternatives. We're headed towards that precipice, right? right? I mean, Libya, we see what's happening in North America. Right, North it's happening Africa. not voluntarily. We're not benefiting from that. We're it's adding to our deficit. It, it's adding to yeah. our deficit, right. and we're seeing what's happening with Japan. Third largest importer of oil in the world has now got a nuclear issue. The only way to power those those to be able to continue to power Japan is going to be through oil. oil. Exactly. Right? So, the, so the best so thing that could happen to us is forcing issue. innovation by getting uh, oil right. to be more expensive. And, and yeah. so the way that it worked in telecom, which then proceeded to create the internet, was you deregulated telecom. Right. And what happened? You had lots of innovation around cable. You had innovation around telcos. Fiber optic got laid by companies that are, you know, global crossing, whatnot. And then guess what? Internet came along. And then guess what? The browser came. And then the apps came. And I'm saying that all America needs to do is not necessarily take a policy aspect, but invest in the infrastructure. If you wanted to actually be able to have interstate Which commerce you're going in to the United in? In, interstate commerce, hang on, right. interstate commerce in the 19, uh, 1920s, 1930s, you built Route 66. What happened? You created not just a means to move goods from one end to the country to the other. But you also created huge amounts of pockets of entrepreneurship. But which innovation are you going to bet on? Which you um, need to right. bet on infrastructure, which, which infrastructure? means that you need to have a grid system right. that allows bi-directional uh, ways of passing energy. I should be able to pull energy into my house, and I should be able to push it out, and then let the let the entrepreneurs figure out how to make a buck on that. And one could say the same about broadband. Uh, broadband in America. I won't argue with that. That's that's fine. That's all. Really? That's all we're pushing on. Okay. Uh, I'd like to move us on because we're talking also about jobs here and technical, technological innovation and jobs. But, but innovation can be a double-edged sword with jobs, right? New technologies can actually increase productivity, remove people from the workplace. Um, it can disrupt entire industries, put many people out, out of a job, as well as creating jobs. So how should America, you know, we say it's great, innovate back and we're going to get tons of jobs. But are we actually looking at what is if essentially uh, a jobless recovery here? And is that because of technology? Or is something going wrong with our model? 
You know, the, um, uh, I've been researching India and China, the difference between the two, because China is investing tens of billions in innovation and R&D research, everything the way America would want it to do it, prescribe it, except there's no innovation happening from state enterprise. It is happening in the small the startups. Yeah. India is the exact opposite. The government is completely, completely incompetent. They're not investing anything in anything <laughs> except their own uh, pockets. And yet, uh, if you go inside the R&D labs, innovation is happening on a scale unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Within five years, India is going to become the number two R&D hub of the world. And no one knows about it. We don't hear about it here because American companies won't talk about it. If they do talk about it, they'll get a backlash from uh, we'll uh, the media. We'll come on to that in a minute. So yeah. But how is India but doing this? India's education system is supposed to be great. Right. It sucks. It's, ho it's horrible. Right. Other than the IITs, which are also second-rate colleges, right. the engineering colleges are churning out complete garbage in India. We talk about Indian math and but science. It's a disadvantage for them. Yet Indians are innovating. How are they doing it? So what's going wrong here? I guess. Well, so India's, here's, here's right, the answer. China's I, I looked into why India's succeeding. What's happening here? It's because the Indian industry built a parallel education system that they take the output of an awful education system and retrain their people. They can take people with very poor education and turn them into R&D specialists. The, the, uh, what the Indians did is the same as what the Japanese did in the 60s and the 70s. They learned American manufacturing techniques and perfected them. The Indians have done the same thing with, with, with human resource development, with intellectual property development, that they have taken the output of a lousy education system and figured out how to retrain the, uh, the people that come out of it, mm. which is workforce development. Right. America's forgotten that. In the 60s when you joined IBM, you'd go through 18 months of training before you expected to be productive. Correct. Now you get a day and a half of orientation. So we're losing people. We're, we're losing we're people basically, off the edge. The industry is discarding people and we're not retraining them. What we need is a massive retraining program right. to make people more productive. Gary, you look skeptical. I'm just trying to understand it. I mean, because I've been to India and that's not my model for what I want our country to be. But I do see that we used to get the brightest people from India coming to our universities. And now, not only are fewer of them seem to be coming, but those who come often, about half of them are returning to India rather than More staying More than half here. of them, yeah. They're than not, half. The best aren't coming here anymore. And, that's, a, that's a different problem. Well, but, but yeah. to me, part of our magic formula is we got the best and the brightest yeah. people from around the world to want to come here and then to stay here to start companies. And that's something that, as a national policy, I think we, we want to do. In terms of our own training, I, I think our universities are, are world class. It's our K through 12 system that, that seems to be the. Can we challenge. come back to that in a minute? I'm sorry. I I it's like the, it's the it job, goes to workforce. The jobs issue. But if it's you like want to talk about jobs, I mean, it is. A, it, there may be a structural change undergoing throughout the world where our level of pro productivity as a world, and it's in the U.S. as well, where you're increasing such that there just may not be enough jobs for everyone. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you create false jobs like TSA agents? Um, <laughs> <laughs> We like TSA agents. Gary's flying in an hour and a half, right? Yeah. So you're in real trouble, pal. They're listening. Didn't really mean that. Yeah, I know you didn't. No, I mean, but, you know, <laughs> President Obama set a very laudable goal that but the U.S. will have the highest percentage of college graduates in the world. Right. But the fact is, is that we have a huge number of jobs structurally which don't require a college education. Right. You know, everyone talks about manufacturing back to the U.S. Well, manufa I mean, I've worked in lots of factories at, at, at starting at 13. It's the worst jobs in the world, and many of you have been in factories. I know that, and you know, and you see that these are not jobs Americans want. We don't want, want these do. jobs back. They do we not want, want these. Back, no. So we don't. So our better example is maybe Germany, where Germany has these highly specialized jobs for you know precision equipment manufacturers, automobiles, ah. things like that, where there's a level of skill involved. Mm. And that to me is maybe but, where, if but, you want but, to go manufacturing, but, that's where you go. But, but my friend Michael Morritt says it's shocking that America has let go all that manufacturing capacity. You know, it's it's a critical, critical part of the innovation process. We have ab you know, abnegated that absolutely core part of, of the job creation process and of the innovation process by outsourcing it. And what Germany did very smartly is protect the Mittelstand. I don't know what Mittelstand means. It means the, <laughs> the middle layer. The middle layer, the, oh, the, the sort of manufacturers. The guys that do all the, the machine tools, the precision mean tool, uh, machine tool manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. So America's actually in trouble because it's let manufacturing we go. We want the high value manufacturing. We don't want the pain manufacturing. We don't want to be manufacturing. Well, we let go a lot of it. Right, I know. But we want the, the high quality stuff. That's I mean, I guess, I guess the question, really, the, question, the core question here is, you know, is what's good for Apple shareholders? Is what's good for IBM shareholders? Is what's good for um, Cisco shareholders? no longer necessarily good for America. Well, considering the fact that the shareholders are all the pensions and, and most Americans, I'd say yes. And I think the challenge that we face in the future is how, what do we do to keep these great American companies headquartered here? How do we 
undergo policies so they don't have to go abroad and create subsidiaries to hire the people they want to hire to deal with the tax situation here. How do we keep them here? Is the question. We have more great innovative countries, companies here than anywhere in the world, unquestionably. But I think we're in danger of losing them right. because of our own government policies on trade, on human resources, and on taxation, and on litigation. We have a litigation tax here, which is unbelievable. Yeah, we'll come, come back we to have. That. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's good. It's good. No, it's but we have point. fewer than. It's we have point. half the that number of companies Absolutely. we have traded on the Nasdaq yeah. we had 15 years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. We have uh, a dramatically drop in the IPO. Sarbanes Oxley. We're putting laws into place which are discriminating heavily against U.S. companies and going right. public. Why is that a good strategy? Stratton, you agree with? You obviously, I, agree, I agree completely with it on, on that side. Of it. That's where really bad policy, you know, kicks in and. I could get on a soapbox for an hour about how we've actually vilified some of the entrepreneurs and you know the the leadership of our country that actually built some of these great companies, and now it's become sport to denigrate them in the media and to you know talk about greed and all the rest of it. Those were the leaders, right, who built most of these companies, and now why would anybody growing up in our education system think of that as a career choice, right, or want to be associated with that kind of entrepreneurism, leadership agenda, uh, uh, value creation, uh, job creation. It just doesn't make any sense anymore. Right? We, we had this discussion. I, I yeah. am okay. scared to death that we're creating a society now through both entitlement of our young people and through the hype of the media where it's not it's not a good thing to actually have a career and become part of a team and challenge convention and win. Right? It's no longer uh, you know, modern thinking. You know, through this, this book, I've been doing a lot of media, and, and I've gotten questions, including a national television show. Why does Bill Gates and Steve Jobs have the right to be rich when there are poor people in the United States? And like, Which television channel was that? Uh, Tavis Smiley on PBS, uh, a <laughs> national show. I mean, interesting. I, I, okay. I, and honestly. Is he a Brit? <laughs> <laughs> so, Gary, why does he have the right to be rich? When <laughs> because they sell something that people are willing to buy, and he's contributed more. Those two people Absolutely. have contributed more to the wealth Absolutely. and achievement of this world than probably any other two people. They okay. have the right to be. That's what makes America America. You have the, uh, the American dream is the ability. The potential to succeed if you create something that's wildly successful, you'll be wildly successful financially. But you're, you raised some but very good points why that's not the case. Oh, yeah. yeah. I I'm wanted good. to get back to the, the point on the job creation. I think there's a, a story about entrepreneurialism which will always you know, be there. And you create Russian billionaires just as commonly now as you create US ones, albeit I don't know the route they take. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but there is something to be said. And, and you know, let's look at the perspective of Apple, as you, as you pointed out. In 1996, you know, their market cap was $237 million, right? And today it's over $320 billion or something like that. The question would be, during that phenomenal phase of growth, how many U.S. jobs were created versus Chinese jobs? And fundamentally, I think when we go back to really saying what kind of scale job opportunities are, and whether we pick off the high-level ones that you guys are addressing, which is high-level manufacturing, or whatever it is, there's got to be some reason, other than just having the headquarters building here, and a potential local government tax break, you've yeah. got to be able to create some jobs in the United States for those people who don't aspire to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, but, but OK, so you, you've been the historical expert on this. So let's talk about this. If you look at the early 1900s, when we built infrastructure, those were menial labor construction jobs. And, and many of them still exist, but it transitioned then into manufacturing with Absolutely. replicated manufacturing and factories and tens of thousands of jobs moving there. And then, you know, over the period of a very long period of time, we moved into service industries and we moved into technology industries. So maybe, just maybe, right, we're going into another period of time where it's a different set of jobs that in fact are for the mainstream and, and do in fact uh, enable tens of thousands of jobs, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs. But it's not the old manufacturing jobs coming back here. We are, a, we are a society who hates to go back and repeat the past. I think the fact, though, that you can't find manufacturing engineers in the United States today is troublesome. I'm not saying that all of the manufacturing that has gone out should stay in the US. But I think that fundamentally, there are some key aspects that we're not encouraging that next layer of you know, high school to college graduates who haven't gone down the entrepreneurial route or the investment banking route mm -hmm. or career paths that need an outlet to be able to vocationally be trained. I, 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 don't, I think we're 
arguing about, <laughs> not I think arguing, I think right? I'm, I'm right. sort of not different sides, but not very yeah. close. I'd like to actually get some questions from the floor, if I may. Um, anybody would like to ask our panel? Uh, and while you're waiting, I just want to point out in China, what they say is Apple is putting $4 into China manufacturing, keeping all the rest for every product, and it's all in the U.S., and it's really unfair, and that's why they have some of these sure. policies which are very detrimental, like indi indigenous innovation, which requires that any technology used in China and sold in China be yes. owned by owned them. By Those are the dangerous yeah. kind of policies we have to start addressing. Okay, question? Uh, yeah, my name is Fanya Montalvo. Um, I'd like you to address the problem of income inequality. And before you start telling me that Bill Gates is responsible, as responsible for the wealthy created to the degree that he has his income, let me just say that it wasn't just him who created that wealth. It was everyone in his company. And there's a myth okay. that those leaders that innovate and make a lot of money, that they did it all themselves. Well, so, well, I, I, I that, want that is, that is the very, biggest very, bunch of question. malarkey that could ever be okay, put you out can, here. You, our right, our we'll valley and we'll tech companies have lived and breathed by building great teams and the whole team taking on some new challenge and coming across the hill. And it's the only industry in the world that ever gave equity to every goddamn employee, including the receptionist at the front desk. Don't come in here and tell us that we have created this inequality. We've actually been the ones who tried to actually equalize it. Yeah, it's like I think that might be a bit hard for us to take here because I mean, we are really looking at the innovation but, side wow. of things rather but, than but in, can, income redistribution. But there's, it's, not only, it's not only income redistribution. It's, it's obviously there's thousands of millionaires that Microsoft has created that are Microsoft employees. But what I was also saying is the, pro the productivity that he enhanced the world with by creating windows and things like that, that people dramatically changed the world and allowed basically uh, it may have destroyed some jobs of secretaries and things like that, but this, the software programs, the, all the different things he's done have raised the entire world standard of living. And, and there's a value there. And whether it's Bill Gates or some unknown, you know, I have a tougher time when people ask me about Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, the guy's only 24, <laughs> but he's but created I, a lot of wealth too. I think, uh, you know, the other thing point to, to think of is a lot of these employees recycle themselves as venture capitalists or That's angels right. or what have you. Yeah. That money, a lot of that money gets recycled back in. Uh, I need to take the next question because we're not going to have any time otherwise. Can I get the next question? Hi, I'm Howard Lieberman, Silicon Valley Innovation Institute. This one I want to lead off for Gary because he has a little bit of a unique perspective. He's been dealing with both government and industry for like decades. So he's got kind of, so here's the question. Uh, and and we've, we've found out at the Innovation Institute that comfort discourages change. So here's the question. Do you think innovation is in trouble in the US because we've become too comfortable to voluntarily change our way of life? And as discomfort is increasing right now, will innovation be growing fast enough to rescue us? I think that's a really well stated question because you know, every empire throughout history, you, you go through stages, and I, I am deathly afraid that we are at the stage of comfort slash arrogance, where we believe as a nation, a people, we are entitled to certain things. And it just happens, like whether it's the electricity or water or fuel, air conditioning. And when you go to India, you realize that, my gosh, a lot of the world doesn't even have those things, and we just assume that. And we're the first generation is actually just stolen from our kids. And our kids are definitely, they may have better technology in some ways, but they're definitely going to have a more difficult life because we've taken their money. So I am with Andy Grove about being paranoid. And the problem in bigger organizations is you're always protecting your turf. And a number of my board members are here, and they, I talk about this a lot, and they agree, thankfully, that we have to be paranoid, not only as an organization, but as a country. Otherwise, you know, the big ones die. Name a company that was in the Dow Jones Industrial Average in the 30s that's around today, other than maybe an oil company. Yeah. They just, that's the challenge we so, face. So are, are McMansions a McMenace? I mean, you know, the fact that we, as an as a American nation, love to consume. You know, we have our big TV sets, we have which are many are on show at the CES. We have our cars that are connected, et cetera. Actually, isn't that a fantastic thing? It is. Isn't that's this a fantastic economy, thing. Is, is, isn't, isn't part of the secret of this economy no, that we but, have but venturesome I, consumers who love to buy? That's great. I, I what I'm talking about is the fact that over 50% of Americans now get a check from the government, that everyone's entitled to health care, to social security, and to education. I mean, there's a thousand things we are now entitled to, but we're entitled to more things that we can afford. 
We can't afford to protect the world and give everyone a check and have health care and kids and education and cash for clunkers and stimulus package and first home time home buyers and low taxes. We can't afford all of it. It's just numbers. Okay. Anybody else want to? The way I'd take it is, though, that consumerism, I think, stimulates innovation. I think the comfort part is what slows us down. So the question is, if you don't, if you believe that you want that LCD TV and it's just out of reach and you know that you know, you're going to have to come up with some higher job to go and achieve it, you're going to want to go get it. Right. And I think that's what drove right alongside the scale notion right. was how do I get as many of these products out and the consumer was willing to work harder to afford it. Yeah. I think the problem that we got into a little bit in the late 2000s was financing became right. easier, which meant that the comfort level, to your point, grew higher. Consumerism stayed the same, but the passion to want to be able to consume with the way I always had changed fundamentally. So, so, so was this a great thing that we had this shocking downturn? Has it really opened well, America's eyes? It's, it, so uh, it's, it's funny. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. I have college-age kids. They'll both be graduating in the next few years. Some of their friends have graduated ahead of them. Can't find jobs, right? And so while I think we've created all of this, we may also be seeing it you know, begin to self-correct in that many of those kids are living at home with their parents, right? They want to work. They actually do want to work, right? Now, they don't, may not want to work as hard as we all wanted to or as our grandparents did when they came here. They may not um, want to take just any job, right? They have these things. But I think we're, we're, the, the facade is cracking, right. and there is going to be a, a, a crisis. Right. So should, should, should we all be tiger mums and tiger dads? That's yeah, a great question. Uh, Vivek's going to say it's it doesn't work question. in China, really. That's not what happens, right? It doesn't happen, and that's the exact opposite. What makes America what it is, is its sense of freedom. The fact that our kids party, they socialize, that's what gives them the ability yeah. to think and to innovate. That's our advantage. Yeah. Everyone wants to be like us, and we read this stupid article in the Wall Street Journal, and we go gaga, oh my god. Stupid. We need to be like the stupid Chinese mom who's been torturing her kids. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> so, so we're successful because we party more. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you got that from Vivek Wadwa and Gary Shapiro on record. OK, uh, next question. Next question, next question? Yeah, one over there. Can you take the microphone, please? I was interested in your comments about the scale of the energy business. And I'm curious whether you, you would say that that scale is, is helping innovation or whether it's impeding it. Do you find in your business that because utilities and other parts of the energy business are so large, that that's leading to uh, longer sales cycles, resistance to innovation, or the opposite? No, I think it's, it, it's the opposite. I think the, the challenge on scale for most of the alternative energy industries is the financing capability. And, and to your point, and I'm not going to go down this route because then all three of these guys will gang up on me again, <laughs> I'll be is government you. policy at one point talked about uh, trying to fund that back gap between when private sector financing disappeared and what do we do? Do we let all these ideas die on the vine? Um, and you know, natural flow would say venture capitalists would simply bury their dead very effectively if they were bad ideas, as they did during the internet reset. Um, unfortunately, it caught that financing issue caught alternative energy at the wrong time. It's too nascent, and so they needed some sort of assistance. The challenge that the that the market has is to what extent is the government willing to invest in the infrastructure? Think the broadband infrastructure for energy, so that entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and financiers can pinpoint a direction to say, this is how we're going to play in energy in the, in the US economy. I think once that gets settled, the scale issue will resolve itself. But aren't you the new biotech in, in this sense that a little. you need years right, to yep. develop, and that capital flow has to keep going? Right? And that return is binary right, in, in many respects. I mean, I, no, uh, we, uh, in all alternative energy? I'm not saying. You know, it, 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 it's binary, as in, in other words, it's very similar to, you know, do you throw up the internet companies and do you get hit or not, right? And then they disappear if they don't. The same thing holds true in biotech, the same thing holds true in green tech. But it's gonna, well, I guess my point was it's going to take longer it's to gonna know, take longer and it's going to take more capital, right? yes. and it's going to take more capital to do it. Correct. And which means that, you know, to some degree, entrepreneurs in green tech don't ever get to be Mark Zuckerberg, right? But that's okay, because that's the new world economics if you want to try and change the world versus be the world's largest uh, answering machine, right? Um, <laughs> you have the choice. And I'm going to get you a hoodie with that on, yeah. world's largest <laughs> answering machine. 
but that is the that's the fundamental that's the fundamental issue. And so to finance that, yeah. entrepreneurs and venture capitalists have to rethink their equity return model. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions at this point? Uh, one here. Next question here. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, uh, to Amit's point about uh, infrastructure, could you comment on uh, whether the European model of 35 hour weeks instead of 80 hours for achieving fuller employment has any relevance here? And also, um, is our next wave of innovation, uh, could it be an infrastructure like uh, domestic crowdsourcing to put everyone back to work? See, I like to think of the 35 hour week as sort of like uh, the equivalent of Google's sort of 20% time. Right, you get all that time off to go think and not do anything, <laughs> but it doesn't really help us in Europe. You know, what is, should America relax a bit, chill out more, party more, take some more time off? Well, I, right, I mean, obviously the statistics show that Americans do put in more hours than I think almost any other developed country. And I think that's part of the American work ethic and it's because we have the rewards that are there. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I don't really understand your second question, but maybe yeah. somebody else did. You know, and my take on what Gary was talking about is I think it goes back to that consumerism notion, which is if I need to afford that television or that house, I'm going to have to put those extra hours in. Uh, sorry, I, just to clarify, uh, my point was aimed at uh, the concept of fewer hours multiplied by more people working as a road to oh, fuller so employment and getting oh, out. Oh, work less? Yeah. And Hi, no, I'm I would call that anti-American. That's that. I'm not there. I, I, yeah, I have I, a problem with that. I, you know, I, I've worked 80-hour weeks since I was very young, and 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 you know, all we talk about is yeah. delayed gratification. I think that's the American work ethic that you talk about, which is a good thing. And if the rewards are, there, I, I view that as one of I our think you like that. Make the pie bigger. Yeah. Don't try to spread it all much. You like well. that? You should <laughs> learn. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Très bien. Okay. Um, <laughs> My wife's French, so I'm in trouble now. Okay, um, <laughs> let, let's, move, let's move on. Um, actually, there was a, one gentleman who, sorry, no, I, I'll take your question, then, I'm, then we'll go on. Okay, Last Thanks, John Phelan. Uh, my question is kind of this. We tend to get the behavior that we measure, and you talked about the incredible amount of money that we spend on R&D, but most of it tends to be short term. And we're increasingly relying on universities and the government funding to do that, but we're also seeing that the government funding for that's going away. Gary, to your point, why should we try to pick a horse? We're not even real sure if we're gonna be riding a horse into the future, it could be a cow. So my question is this, given the short-term nature of the way that we measure our companies, how do we drive better long-term behavior when it comes to investing in innovation in R&D? Yep. That is a really good question. Well, you discourage <laughs> and, 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 and the answer and, is? And I understand the discourage bad behavior through clawback mechanisms because, and, and, and obviously there is a preference in our tax code for long-term gains over short-term gains. And there's increasing preferences, especially at the state level, for various types of investments that are long-term within the state. Which is, so those are, there's some opportunities there, but you raise one of the weaknesses of the capitalist system, which is the focus on the very short-term rather long-term. Look, look, let's be honest, what got us into this economic mess is the mortgage business, which was totally a house of cards short-term that was designed to collapse. And that is a fundamental problem that, that politicians of both parties are trying to deal with. But, uh, but our capital markets also have played a role in making our, our companies and our CEOs and our leaders, right, short-term focused, right? It's that 90-day right. metric, it's right. that 90-day hamster trail. And, and it does take a reset to say, we believe we're going to, actually one of my board members once said this when we were talking about our shareholders, right? He said to me, Stratton, you don't have shareholders anymore, you have share renters, right? So the reality is you should do what you think is right for the company long term and the hits and misses and the roller coaster of the stock price and the you know, uh, short selling and the rest, you'll outlive them all, right, is what he, he kept telling me. And I, and I think he or was not. right. right? <laughs> well, but, but you, you have, to, you have to, I did not have an enlightened <laughs> board, trust me. <laughs> but you do have to ignore the capital markets and we're still not past that point where people listen to the capital markets. And, and it's a huge problem for any kind of a recovery. And it's a huge problem for putting applied research into any budget. Okay, um, I'd like to move on. And I'd like to talk about the, the, people talk a lot about the military industrial complex, but what about the university industrial complex? Because you know, for us, the Economist in 1980, when the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, which effectively allows American universities to keep the IP that they get when they take federal funding, you know, we called it probably the most important piece of legislation that had been passed in America for half a century. 
Now, I have heard since I've been here the last couple of years, people say to me, it's going wrong. There are problems with our technology transfer out of universities into, into industry. And part of the problem is that go, it, all of the universities want big hits. They all want the next big thing. And they don't pay any attention to the smaller stuff, which actually could be great for creating jobs. Um, and we've got now these sort of tech transfer offices that, that they're like bureaucr you know, bureaucracies and bottlenecks and, and it's all going wrong. And in fact, HP told me not so long ago that they now prefer to deal with French, Russian and Chinese universities because they can get stuff done quicker with them. Do, do you see this as a real problem? Not in the university yeah, research system is the biggest inhibitor to entrepreneurship in America. We put $42 billion into it every year. We get $2 billion in license revenue out of it. The entire system, yeah, the entire system is antiquated. I mean, uh, over the last 40 years, we spent over $1 trillion on university research, and we get literally $2 billion out of it a year. The entire system is based on, uh, uh, you have these tech transfer offices which are uh, uh, holding the entire innovation process hostage because right. the way they're measured. The problem is that um, they get compensated, uh, rewarded, for the number of patents that are filed and for the license revenue they extort from companies. The result is that that's all they focus on. Professors don't know how to commercialize their technology. The only, the only four or five universities in America where the system works, Stanford is one of them. And the reason why it works at Stanford is because the professors come to events like this, they meet venture capitalists, they interact with uh, researchers, and they bypass the university system. And the university system doesn't try to stop them. So is, is that the solution? Is, is, is giving it, professors well, the right to bypass? Well, the Supreme Court right now is looking at legislation yeah. by which the professors will own their own inventions. If that goes through, you'll see a major, major boost in entrepreneurship because what will that mean? That will mean is that the, uh, the inventors own their invention and they don't have to, uh, right now it's a monopoly. You've got to go through these uh, TTOs, technology transfer offices, which impede the innovation. Right. They'll be able to be free agents and negotiate with anyone that wants to license their technology. So we really yeah, want the Supreme Court to yes. deal with this? Yeah, but I mean, I mean remember, let's never forget Xerox Park, right? right? Nobody wants to be Xerox Park in that situation. So I understand the university's right. dilemma. The other side of that so is- What do you mean by Xerox Park in that wh situation? Where's the mouse? The I PC? See. I see, we didn't all that. That's exactly what we want, though. We, and they exactly didn't make a dime no, off no, no, that No, no, by stuff. mistake. Uh, you see, what happens is like, like in uh, Stanford, the Google founders have given back you know, millions, uh, tens of millions of absolutely. Uh, back to Stanford. What happens in the long term is that by letting the innovation go and succeed, you end up gaining more because you have successful entrepreneurs who give back to the universities. That's a unique thing in America. In India, it never happens. In most no. other countries, you don't give back to universities. Here, you do. Although it's starting to in India. It's, it's starting it's still, to get there. But, still, um, but I, th I think the bigger question is, is that if, if, we, if we do, you know, you have two questions, right? You lay the fair story where you hope for the kindness to, to fund the endowments of Harvard and Stanford to continue their research process. The other way is you could potentially look at changing the, the objectives of the TTOs. I mean, I know I'm personally locked in one of those situations for the last three years. My company's been around three years. We're still trying to license one technology for the last three years. And, and so that is the kind of bureaucracy that we need to remove. But at the same time, I understand why the university is going, wait a minute, that technology may be the next mouse. I don't want to give it up. They're worried about leaving too much on the table. The result is nothing gets out. Right. That's why the TTO They're needs to be put out of business. They need to yeah. be shut down completely. So and allow the, allow the professors to be free agents to negotiate their so technology. It'll work a lot better. Right. So you'd like to put people out of work to make more jobs, yes, ultimately. Absolutely. And Armit would like to make sure that they behave better in work. And they, they won't, they won't because they're lawyers. They're, they're, they're lawyers. Made, that's true. Sure that, <laughs> is to negotiate. that is true. That is very I will, true. I will say, here in the Valley, in, in the 80s, Defend them. In the 80s, it, yeah. worked, it worked wonderfully. Yeah, it did, you didn't, right? Yeah, yeah, you didn't have that. I mean, Before the first, Baidol, I mean. Yeah, the first company I was involved, Rick remembers this, with John Hennessy. You know, our president right. Stanford was a computer scientist, and he was the Bidol. founder Bidol of Bidol was 80, so, so that yeah. was after Baidol. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I don't think the offices were there. I mean, yeah. really, it was still a very sort of amateur stuff. Because but the professors themselves, uh, you know, know enough about their technology to know how to, uh, I mean, to how, to, how to negotiate deals for it. You just have to educate them a little bit. Right. right now, they're ignorant. They get rewarded for publishing papers, which means publishing, putting everything in public domain. Yeah. You need to tweak that system as well. Yeah. So they get tenure equally for... Uh, commercializing the technology as right. they do for That's publishing brilliant. papers. That needs to be fixed. Yep. You fix that and you give them ownership and immediately you'll see um, a boom in innovation like never before. Because literally we have a trillion dollars of knowledge locked up in our universities, a trillion dollars. Yeah. Right. Can I, can I, I was on the board of Virginia's largest university and our goal there was to uh, make sure we had sufficiently favorable licensing terms with the, with the 
professors so that they would want to stay there, they would want to come there. So it's a competitive situation. But second, I, I'm, I'm listening to this whole conversation, and not only is it way beyond me, but it's like, this is going to be a lot less relevant in the future because there's going to be a lot less money flowing to universities in the United States, and that's going to be the bigger issue. So then the question will be, how do you incentivize those researchers? And I guess maybe it'll be taken care of because you'll be allowed to keep more because there'll be less money there to what, play with. What'll happen is the private industri industry will start negotiating professors, funding the research directly. And we're saying the same It'll thing. It'll be a lot more applied. You know, in, we talk about Virginia, Anish Chopra, before he became CTO of the United States, I was actually working with him to de design a new system. They were trying to buy out the universities. Um, state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, um, all of the universities in Virginia gained $42 billion from license revenue from all of their inventions. The idea was to give them $42 billion and say, okay, everything in Virginia is open source. Any, uh, tech, uh, any company that wants to license technology can get it for free. The only catch is you have to build a company here and stay here for five years. That was the bill he was trying to do, but the, the state ran out of money before he could do it. Right. But that's right. the type of innovative thinking that you need. Yep. Okay. Um, we do have a balanced budget in Virginia. <laughs> 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 Are you listening, California? Okay. Um, uh, while we're on the subject of universities, let's, let's stay there. I mean, uh, does America have a fundamental problem in terms of a, a skill gap and its ability to generate enough of the right kinds of science engineering graduates? And are, are we making those jobs sexy enough for the younger generation to say, you know, I want to be a rock star engineer, I want to be a rock star whatever, scientist. Have we lost it or is, is we, we We've got the talent except the problem. You know, I, I live this every day. Duke University, I'm at the Masters of Engineering Management program. The best of the best students come, go through my classes there, except the best of the best students become investment bankers because they start their salaries at $120,000 a year versus civil engineering, they still get $55,000 a year. In any other engineering, they get sixty or seventy thousand yeah. dollars a year. They end up uh, getting forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of loans they have to pay off. And they always come to me and say, "Professor, what should we do? We've got this hundred twenty thousand dollar offer at Goldman Sachs, or the sixty thousand dollar offer in engineering. I've got this loan to pay off." Because they know how furious I get when they become investment bankers. I mean, it, it's. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm known for that at Duke. What, what did they say to you in 2008, 2009? I want to be an investment bank. Oh, no, hang on. I changed my mind. Actually, I quite like to do what you the do. The trouble is it's hard again. Yeah. I mean, so came back very quickly, they're getting back it? into investment banking just like that. But is that a problem? Because it's of a course big problem. Are you kidding? Well, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, waste of talent. But that's not that I All mean, the kind of investment is bankers, 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 stealing from our society but versus getting back to it. Investment bankers recycle capital into all these wonderful companies that make the future of America, right? You know, they do the M&A deals. They do that. Yeah, God, I'm yeah, defending yeah, investment yeah, yeah, bankers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that's what they do. This yeah, is part yeah, of Gary's yeah. point about no. But yeah, about yeah, the yeah. Actually, I would use lawyers as the example rather than investment Yeah, sorry. Well, I used to. Yeah. Okay. So, so obviously we have more lawyers in this country than almost all the other countries in the world combined. So what do we do? We export them and trade them for oil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. good idea. Now we have it. Uh, oh, that was simple. Idea. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, President have, Obama, but I don't, I, don't think there's market, I don't think there's necessarily a skill fine. gap on the, the university side. I think what it is, is to, to Vivek's point, is there is no apprenticeship, there is no immediate gratification right. on doing an engineering right. degree. And you know, only when you, know, you start to see companies like Google and Facebook really show up that people suddenly start to see the salaries of engineers rise. Right. But with the dot-com bust, everybody's engineering processes went down, right. prices changed, you were able to offshore that. Uh, I don't think the, the universities are not producing quality engineers. Right. I just don't think we're leveraging them as a country in the right way. So, so, so what do we do about this? I, mean, I remember seeing the, uh, the wonderful Intel ad where they took the, the gentleman who invented the USB key and you know, he was in his sort of pocket, you know, his pocket protector, his, his sweater and stuff, and he walked through the, um, the canteen and everyone was like, yeah, you're a star, and they wanted his autograph, and, and that ad ran around it saying, you, know, you can be rock stars. Are we not doing enough of that in America? Should we be you know, lauding these people, lauding Armit, what? get Armit on stage <laughs> and, and uh, <laughs> you know, make you a hero? What can we do? Well, you know, and, and part of that is, is the vanity side, which may, may move a lot of these engineers. But there's another portion which, to Vivek's point, is I've got a $60,000 uh, debt because I went to Duke. Right. That, you know, what, you know how the, the, when the U.S. Army Corps ran out of doctors, what did they do? They basically forgave loans of medical schools. Right. The same thing can happen in engineering where you could have a government program to say, look, 
we will stop. You don't need to make payment mm -hmm. as long as you're mm -hmm. productive in the United States on an engineering program right. for the first five years. And that simple program is not, you know, it's not bankrupting the school, it's not right. bankrupting the, the government, but it's giving the engineer a chance to say, I will forego that investment banking immediate gratification to potentially be part of two or three product releases and then I figure out if I want to be an entrepreneur, an investment banker, or a management consultant, or God forbid, a lawyer, right? Um, but those are the ways that you can Mine, allow that I would level sound, of growth. I'm sound like a socialist over here, but I would make STEM education free for American citizens. You'd make it free? American citizens. For American citizens. The, you know, that's a qualifier there. Kay. Let the foreigners come and pay the, uh, the high fees. Right. But offer subsidies, scholarships, whatever it takes to make it so worth But right now, our PhDs, I mean, uh, I, I was shocked when one of my best students decided to do a PhD in engineering, and he was getting a $29,000 a year stipend. This guy could have gotten out, gone out and made $150,000 a year at right. Goldman Sachs, right. but this, he was wanted to be a professor, so he had to make an ultimate sacrifice of taking almost nothing. They should, we, he should have gotten a $90,000 a year uh, stipend because he's a master's graduate from a top university. The system is flawed right yeah. now. It, it's interesting, the United States is probably the only country that treats its out-of-state citizens the same way it treats its international students, so we, they, they pay the same tuition. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Every other country, if you're, if you're in the country, you pay the tuition, there's an added country. We just, you know, if you're out of California or you're out of Virginia, you pay the same as the international students. Mm -hmm. Which is, it's an interesting point, but you're right. What you're saying is to use tax policy in a way which favors those who goes into narrow areas, which is, I think is a legitimate role of government, is to try to figure out where there's shortages and to try to encourage those, whether right. it's medical or scientific or otherwise, and, and maybe even discourage others. Yep. Like right now, for example, lost schools are cash cows. <laughs> Back to they the have no <laughs> research re requirements, they have no laboratories, they have no anything. So you get the law student tuition. Colleges love that, man. It, it makes money for every college that has a law school. And it doesn't make any sense because we really do have too many lawyers. If any of you are lawyers in the room, we love you really. We really do. It's just please, please don't take this personally. I'm actually Apart from a Gary. member of two bar associations. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to, because we're talking about <laughs> foreigners there. Let's talk about immigration. Right. Because for me, you know, uh, right. coming right. from right. Europe, and I, I look at America, and I come to Silicon Valley, you know, amazing melting pot, fabulous talent from all over the world. And yet I start hearing people say, you know, America's getting it wrong. There's a problem with this immigration system here. These H-1Bs, you know, they treat you as though they don't want you when you come in. You know, you apply, and it's all temporary. You know, a wife can't work, a spouse, a husband can't work. You know, I have to tell them I'm going to go back, you know. And, of course, I say, when I came in, I said, yeah, I really want to go back to a place where it rains, the food sucks, and it's a <laughs> socialist republic of Europe. But I <laughs> and they believe me, and they believe me, which is wonderful. But for most people, you are saying to them, you're here temporarily. You might be brilliant, but, you know, get lost after five what years. What are you complaining about? You know, we think you're brilliant because you have a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I came here. It covers everything else up. So, so, so no, but seriously, what, what, what's wrong with this? Martin, what's wrong I, with this immigration system? What do we do? I had my do? most recent death threat yesterday for writing about immigration. I wrote two articles about the startup visa, and I knew it would happen. I, I got my first death threat. Fabulous. Like I, get two hours later. I get three and a week. So, yeah, yeah, I know. But the point <laughs> over here is us. that... Uh, I've documented the fact that 52% of the startups yeah. in Silicon Valley are founded like people like you right. and I, foreigners. Right. I mean, uh, so the fact is that foreigners have uh, have been but more productive at innovating in this country than they are in their own, own right. countries, and they're taking on the natives and making this country what we are. Right. We have to do basically is to have a free flow of skilled talent. Let, right. the, let Americans compete. This is what makes this country what it is, is the fact that you've had wave after wave of in immigrants coming here, challenging the people before it, making them work harder, making, you know, this issue about do we work 35 hour work weeks? Never in America have you been able to do that because you've always had a wave of foreigners coming in, taking the jobs away of all these people who are getting lazy and complacent and making them compete. That's why America is a world leader right now. And we need to keep that happening. But the trouble is that for the first time ever, the America is suffering a reverse brain drain. People don't even know what that is. Right now, there's this major outflow of talent happening from here to India and China. These Chinese companies we talked about, if you went and interviewed them, you find about 35 to 40% of them have returnees from the United States at their, at their home. Right. Right. Should we rather than we talk about immigration, we should talk about strategic immigration. Rather than who we don't want, we should say, who do we want? Yeah. And who we want are highly trained people, the brightest people, the most creative, the entrepreneurial people. Right. And I know you've been behind this legislation in Congress that's just being introduced, which says if you're an entrepreneur, if you have a certain amount of money, if you're going to create a certain amount of jobs, <laughs> we want you. And ra rather, we have this policy where Iceland is treated the same as India in terms of the number of people that can come here. It's kind of a, a lottery. And we also are, are take every relative of every person. I mean, it's, it's 
promiscuous immigration, in a sense, rather than strategic. Stratton, thoughts? No, I mean, I completely agree with you. We have, it's another one of the things we have forgotten how we got here, right? And why we got here. And it was, you know, the people with the strongest uh, uh, skills for survival, the best work ethic, and the desire to actually make a great new life. And right. those are the people we should continue to warn here. L let me turn it around and say, why should we care? Why should we care if they go back to India and they go back to China and what have you? Because, because, because they take IP with them. You know, you're saying it's an IP. Thing. But actually, isn't this a global lab now? Don't we live in a global world where you get, you know, Microsoft has its massive India research centers. You know, if they if researchers cycle round, that's a good thing. You know, no. Maybe you can keep in touch with them, you know, like a McKinsey alumni network and share, inf no, actually McKinsey gets good at sharing different kinds of information with people it shouldn't, but, <laughs> but when it does share stuff that it should, you know, maybe that's the thing that America has to get used to the fact. Let's like make our neighbors can't. richer, that's what he's saying. Well, there's, there's yeah. a strategic value in having people familiar with the American culture and lifestyle and language all around the world, whether it's militarily or, or just diplomatically. But I'll tell you, I every year for 20 years have met with my counterparts from around the world. People had technology trade associations. And there was a 10 year period where they would just glare at me saying, you're taking all our best people. We're losing all our top engineers and scientists and IT people to the US. And I'd say, well, it's a, you know, it's a free market for human capital and it's a good thing. <laughs> they don't say that anymore. Okay. I'd like to open to questions. Um, we've covered a lot of ground there. So I'm hoping that there'll be a fair few questions here. I see one coming. Uh, here we go. Hi again. So uh, uh, creative people create not because it's dictated to them, they're told to it, or because it's legislated. They create because they want to and because they have degrees of freedom in their life. This is to the education thing. So what schools provide to creative people, having been the dean of a polytechnical school for five years, universities provide unparalleled degrees of freedom in the life of creative people. That's why creative people like to be on faculties at schools. But to Vivek's point, they only provide this degree, these degrees of freedom psychologically, not financially, because the most prestigious schools have the most punitive IP policies. The better the school, the more of you they want to own. You go to an unknown school, they have no IP policy at all. You can invent whatever you want and have all of the freedom. So the most creative entrepreneurial people in the world do not go to prestigious schools. They go to schools that don't have strong IP policies so they could do their thing. So here's the question for the panel. What do you think about the idea of instead of the prestigious schools trying to partner with bureaucratic large organizations, because it's two bureaucracies trying to have an innovative child, not gonna happen. What about small schools that have no IP constraints partnering with entrepreneurs? Couldn't we just turn the whole thing upside down? You know, let me talk about my research on that because I actually researched the background of, of several hundred uh, company founders in tech industries, successful entrepreneurs, and despite the fact I'm at Duke, Harvard, Berkeley, and now Emory, you know, four very prestigious universities, I published a paper which created a lot of controversy with these universities because what we showed was that there was no correlation between the university you graduated from and your success as an, entre as an entrepreneur, as an innovator. In fact, um, uh, what we found was that the vast majority of successful entrepreneurs Dropped out of Harvard. Yeah, came, no, no, not dropped out of Harvard. <laughs> they dropped out of North Carolina State University. They completed North Carolina State University. Right. They graduated, they weren't dropouts. This dropout is a myth. Silicon Valley lives in its own bubble. They think that the average you know, tech entrepreneur is a young white uh, male who dropped out of Stanford or Harvard. That's false. The, the typical entrepreneur is 39 years of age. The typical entrepreneur has 13 to 16 years of, of experience, and they started companies because they had experience, they had ideas that they gained from their, from their work. So there's so many myths over here. And the other thing is about elite education. Elite education doesn't make you a better entrepreneur. It makes you a better investment banker. So, so let, me, let, me just, <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just oh say, boy. you're propagating a myth there. We don't believe that. That, right. that may be what the media reports, right. and it may, when there's the next Zuckerberg or the rest, that's the stories that are fun to have. But we've all been, I've been in six companies in the Valley and worked with tons of entrepreneurs who will never be famous, but they were the best and the brightest and the hardest working in the rest. So I don't think we in the Valley believe that. Uh, I go think look at Paul, I look at Y Combinator, look at the people that are in it. They're all young, white, you know, college uh, dropouts. I mean, uh, yes, if you go and look at all these things, look at what Peter Thiel is doing, offering $150,000 to any kid that drops out of school so that uh, uh, the, you know, he can work and uh, they can destroy their careers, you know, working uh, in one of his- I completely incubators. agree with you, but that's not what I know, but most the of the people in the Valley are doing. I, it's, not, it's not what actually happens, but the myths over here, the perception in the venture capital community, they all hang around um, these young kids 
assuming that the next you know great Zuckerbergs are going to come from uh, one of the uh, are going to be one of these kids who drop out. But they're also funding the yeah. guys who are in the 30s. Yeah, with, they, they with really the good not experience. I've, I've actually I've talked to so people in the 30s. There. They don't get funding. That's what the problem is. Maybe right. I'll throw a different. Right. I'm in that. In the, 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 the the way what makes us different as a country. Maybe radar is different. I mean, I'll grant you that. <laughs> okay. Go for it, Gary. Go for it. What makes, okay, us, di what makes us different as a country, which I think is really good, is here you could fail a number of times, and that's considered ah. experience. Yeah. And that's ah. unlike anywhere yeah. else in the world. I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's spot on. Next question. Hi, uh, Jim Turner. I'm with Affinity Communication. Um, there's been a couple of themes that I've heard uh, throughout today's conversation. Most of it is government is bad. <laughs> um, and uh, my question is this, some time ago I heard Admiral Woolsey at a conference board conference talk about the importance of infrastructure and that it's, as, may, as you said, it's a national security issue, um, it's an economic issue and one thing I've heard from this panel is that in order to, to succeed we really need to think about scale. That is, we need to scale out our technologies. And I argue that we can't scale out those technologies until we have an infrastructure on which to build that. Um, uh, also, uh, if you think back to, and I hate to use the old, um, the, the old story, but to the Kennedy and the Sputnik moment. Um, at what point, how do we make engineering and infrastructure sexy Kay. in the way that making money and the space race was? Let's take that one. So, so how, do, how does this Sputnik yeah. moment work? How do we do this? You know, I, I think that Sputnik moment is a, is a great analogy. And when we actually talked to uh, President Obama about that jobs creation in clean tech two years ago, the fundamental thing was not that we had to announce the Sputnik moment, but it was that NASA also allowed Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, and thousands in the quote unquote military industrial complex to thrive as entrepreneurs, right? You saw a huge uplift in the number of people, what it was that, you know, heck, even Tang got a lot of value out of the space program, right? Um, the question is when you make these big infrastructure bets, you have an opportunity to create entrepreneurialism, whether it's, you know, somebody thinking about a new way to be constructive crea creation, um, and it creates a huge GDP growth. And I think that that was exactly what I think the broader intent of that Sputnik moment was. I don't think it was a moment to say, everybody get on clean energy's bandwagon, but everybody start to think about the infrastructure pieces. And by the way, energy is not the only one. There's the telecom piece. There's also the, I mean, we saw the famous issue two years ago around Iowa's dams breaking apart, the roads. I mean, there's a lot of this that we have to figure out how to do just so that we can continue to be able to ensure that the reliability and the invisibleness of the infrastructure in the US remains so. Kay. And it's just not there. Thank you. Next question. Do we have a next question? Yep, one here. Hi, my name is Lee Anderson. Um, I have a question actually as a, mainly as a, a foreigner that come to US for graduate school and see all these changes in the last uh, 30 years. And uh, you know, I agree with you know, lots of issue like you know, the um, the immigration um, policy and also too many lawyers and also uh, U.S. the middle class and disappearing Tiger very quickly. All those things, what I'm saying is, you know, lots of great ideas and the policy obviously need to be changing and need to be addressed. But uh, why is not happening? Is that because of the lobbyists? Or how, how this whole policy is really, um, uh, you know, address those issues, was that, you know, to us as a foreigner coming to see is all those, is the two parties, is all, what is them, what do they get, and the other party is so little talk about what is really good for this country, what it really should address this. Is that really U.S. need to have a greater leader like Tom Jefferson or something like that, really truly to go some dramatic changes because we really see always is like, Big gigantic machine becomes so, so bureaucratic. More leadership from the top. Yeah. That's uh, how I, I, I hope this get. panel can maybe talk a little bit more yeah. about us. <laughs> right, all leadership right. from the top. Stratton, uh, we, we have the right leadership. Right, we're all, you're, you're seeing us all not. I mean, I don't think we could agree with you more <laughs> that these things. Sh Stratton, have, Stratton have, have you, run for president. Have, have you been, to, DC, have you been to DC? Have you talked to our representatives? Because you come away running and screaming from the halls, right? It's not about what the right thing is to do, it's about what the political thing is to do and who's 
constituents need to be supported. And I mean, let's talk about my favorite one recently is the, the second pl engine for the, uh, I forget, the second engine for the fighter that, you know, Gates says he doesn't want, that they couldn't kill for 18 months, right, did. in this budget. They finally did, right, but it was because of jobs, local and the rest. It's, our government is very frustrating, and I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble for this, but our government is, is very frustrating in that it's not about what we should do, it's about what we can do to someone else or what's, we, what promises we've made others or what lobbyists are the strongest in all these models. And it's very frustrating for whether it's entrepreneurs or CEOs or people who just want to use common sense to make forward progress in these policies, it doesn't work in Washington. And I think that is, that is a fundamental flaw in, in all of the U.S. You know, notion of innovation that I'm not sure how we get around. I actually don't have answers to this. Well, I first of all, thank you for yeah, raising the question. Absolutely. Thank you for coming here and investing your time and life in, in the United States. Look. The Consumer Electronics Association is 2,000 technology companies. We're an association, and that's one of the freedoms we have in this country is to get together and petition our government. Our board sat down a few years ago, and they said, you know what, the most important thing for the technology industry in the United States is the health of the U.S. economy. And they agreed that the health of the U.S. economy is being <laughs> threatened, frankly, by actions of our own government. And it's not that all government is bad. There is a role for infrastructure, and there's a role in education. But the government is not doing its job, and it's not prioritizing, it's not investing in our children, it's investing in our, I, a lot of it is ourselves, our, our, our own comforts today rather than investing in tomorrow, which is unprecedented in the U.S. So the, basically the board of the Consumer Electronics Association, which actually owns the book that's before you and is available outside, said, you know what, this is so important, innovation is so important, we created something called the Innovation Movement which now is over 100,000 Americans, which subscribes to the, a lot of things we're talking about here today. It says our job as an association is not to fight for ourselves and for our tax preferences, but to fight for the economy of the U.S. because it seems that nobody else is. We got out there immediately and embraced, embraced the, uh, without really even seeing the full results, the, the results of this deficit reduction commission, which said higher taxes, lower spending. And we said, let's prioritize and say what's important. And those are the policies on trade, on spectrum, on innovation, on human capital, which is that this is important, innovation. When you're in as much trouble as we are as a country, you could either tax, cut spending, or grow. We want to focus on growth and innovation, and that's the mission of our association. I'll make briefly. Yeah, I've got uh, two things for you. Number one, Mary Meeker just did a piece that's available at kpcv.com slash USA Inc., which actually highlights in a 25-page piece the real issue in the United States. But a friend of mine who's a Chinese national who's in the <coughs> solar industry basically put it best. Sometimes in America, the issue that they have biggest is there's too much democracy. I mean, okay, I, I'm going to have to bring that camp. The, too much democracy cannot be the last phrase. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. You haven't heard my wrap up yet. <laughs> uh, and it's really hard to wrap something like this up because we've covered so much ground. But I thought I'd do like a just a very brief A to Z to try and sort of summarize some of the things that we've done. Uh, a is for Amit Chatterjee, who did a fabulous job bringing the clean tech uh, story to the panel. Please thank Amit for me. B is for brain drain. It could be a serious problem, according to some of my colleagues. I actually think it's not. I think it's brain circulation, and I think it's an excellent thing. C for Chindia. We've spoken a lot about China and India. Bamboo capitalism. Read The Economist. Sorry, that is another plug. Um, but actually, Vivek says they're stuffed, so you don't need to worry about them. So you make your minds up where, the, where we are on there. A D, diffusion. How do you get ideas out of university labs? How do you get them into university labs and then out of university labs and into products? We talked a lot about that and some concrete ideas there. Education, you know, tiger mum, tiger dad, or just parties like it's 1999. Maybe we should just party and hope that's the way forward. But actually, there are some very serious issues on education that came up in this panel. And I think all of you, in the, as parents, as mentors, perhaps as school board governors or on boards of universities, I hope you take away some very interesting thoughts from this and lobby for change. Uh, F funding and France, the 35 hour week, God bless them. G, Gary Shapiro. Gary, a round of applause for Gary. Fabulous. <laughs> um, 
Very interesting thoughts there. H for heroes. We need more rock stars, more Intel rock stars. America needs more rock stars and we need to create them. Cool and awesome. Um, the HP, uh, Leo Apoteka, who came from Germany, says, I've learned two words in California. Cool and awesome. We need to make these jobs cool and awesome for everybody. And thank God that Harvard, uh, about half of the graduating class, turned down being investment bankers and lawyers from 2009. So Harvard is learning its lesson. That's good. Uh, I interdisciplinary work, I mean, one thing we didn't touch on, I really think the strength of America is being able to bring things together, mashups, lots of different technologies, places like Carnegie Mellon where you bring robotics, you bring biology, you bring nanotechnology, all together. It's one thing America does fabulously well, so I just added that in there because I thought it was important. J for jobs, we need more of them. How can we develop them? K for Karen Tucker, thank you, Karen, for inviting Economist. Thank you for putting on this fabulous, fabulous event. L for licensing. We we need to fire all these uh, technology transfer offices according to Vivek. We need to give them more money according to, no, maybe that wasn't quite right. We need to incent them better according to Amit. M, manufacturing, should we have it here? Does it really matter? Do we need the engineers in America? N, national interest. What is our national interest here? How important is technology to the national interest? And I think everything you've heard today, it's vital, but that doesn't necessarily mean techno-nationalism. I have to be very careful how one balances that. Um, uh, where did I get to? Oh, open innovation. Very important for America. Absolutely stay open to ideas. Import people, import ideas. P, promiscuous immigration. That's a great phrase, Gary. I'm going to trademark that and pretend it's mine. That's in The Economist next week. Q, <laughs> Q questions. Thank you so much for your questions. They were excellent questions. Helped us steer the debate and show what's important here to you. Our restaurant, everyone must dine in Stratton's restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, he's going to lose his one Michelin star. Uh, S, size, size matters. It's also for Stratton Slavos. Ladies and gentlemen, Stratton did a fabulous job here. Um, and a Sputnik moment. The Sputnik moment, we are in one. T for taxes. We didn't really get into tax policy, but tax policy is very important. Long-term, short-termism, it can incent how much R&D is done here. U for universities. America still has great universities, but needs to think very carefully about how it continues to build them. V, Vivek Wadwa. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Provocateur from the last moment, absolutely fabulous. And V also for venturesome consumers, which I maintain, keep spending America, because it's really where it matters, and buy all those great goods and services. W is where you must be wondering what I'm going to say for X. And X actually marks the spot where Y, it's time for me to close. Yes, it's time for me to close. And Z, zero time left, over to Karen Tucker. Thank you, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Wow, 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 very good. So, Gary, Stratton, Amit, Vivek, and Martin, thank you for sharing your passion, your energy, and your perspectives. So candidly, we all very much appreciate it, I know. And as a gesture of thanks, we have for each of you our very cool looking Churchill Club t-shirt. I hope you'll wear it with pride. CEA, thank you again for your sponsorship, and I want you all to know if you did not pick up your copy, of Gary's wonderful book, new book already, a New York Times bestseller. CEA has very kindly and generously offered copies for each of you, so if you have not picked it up, there should be one waiting on the table for you out there. You've been a great audience. Thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you soon at a Churchill Club event. Good night.